what I want to take the opportunity to talk to you a little bit about is I think actually the previous talk actually that you watched is going to um, dovetail beautifully with what I want to say. And so what I'm going to talk to you today about is something called deception. And you might ask, why would you talk about deception? Well, let's just have a, and what I'm going to do is I'm going to talk about it in the context of the lives of transgender people and why I think this is a narrative that has to change. It's a narrative that needs to stop. So let's just have a look, first of all, at the definition of deception. Our monitor here is not working, so I'm going to step forward every once in a while and check where I'm at. So deception. This, I got this from dictionary.com on the internet. So the act of deceiving, the state of being deceived, or something that deceives or is intended to deceive. So again, you ask yourself, where am I going with this? Well, what I want to talk about it is in the context of transgender lives. And you may ask yourself, well, do people really believe that transgender people are deceptive? And my answer is yes. This is a very common narrative about transgender people. So we are, you know, you often see on television shows, you know, I remember as a kid watching Maury Povich, can you tell who's transgendered? And there'd be a whole audience would be voting and people would get it wrong and they'd be like, oh my God, I can't believe I got it wrong. <laughs> and so there's a the whole concept that somehow these transgender folks are actually out to deceive people. But you ask, well, that's maybe just on, you know, talk shows and media, but not in real life. But you know what, in fact, Quite frankly, recently, as recently as 2013 in the UK, there was a judgment found against a trans man where he was convicted, now convicted of sexual assault because he did not disclose to his partner his transgender status. I.e., because he was a trans male and surprised this woman with no penis, which I guess is a surprise to a lot of women, um, because he did that, he was actually convicted of a crime. So essentially in the UK, as a transgender person, you have to disclose your status. Now, I often thought that's kind of amusing because could you imagine if everyone had to disclose all the truth about themselves before they engage in sexual activity? A lot of women would be very mad at a lot of men. They'd be like, I swear to God, I look bigger in the mirror. <laughs> but the point being, this is again, the idea of somehow there is an act of willful deception. Make sure I change my thing here again. So, where, you know, so you ask yourself, well, you know, here we are in Canada, you know, possibly, you know, a progressive liberal country with liberal social values. And how can we, you know, be in this situation? Well, if you look at Canada as a whole, there is a sort of a mixed per uh, perception and perspective around transgender people. In terms of law and human rights, here in the province of Ontario, Transgender rights are protected. The Human Rights Code, which was Toby's Law or Bill 33, states explicitly that gender identity and gender exp expression is a protected human right here in the province of Ontario. Again, if you look across Canada, there are only three other jurisdictions that provide that, that right. One is Nova Scotia, one is Manitoba, and one is the Northwest Territories. In every other jurisdiction, there is no specific protection for gender identity or gender expression as a human right. So what's happening? Well, federally, believe it or not, there was a bill passed in the House of Commons, Bill C-279, which explicitly pre pre uh, protects gender expression and gender identity as a human right. And interestingly enough, this bill passed the House of Commons with all party support. Now, not entirely all party support, and you can imagine which party might not have all supported it. But that party still had six cabinet ministers and, and 12 other members of that party, the Conservative Party, including the foreign minister and the finance minister, who supported this bill. So you think, woo, it's going to the Senate. As you know, Canada's Senate has a wonderful reputation as an august buddy of second thought. <laughs> Just ask Mike Duffy. And so my point is, of course, you know, so this will most likely be passed into consent. It'll get received royal assent and become the law of the land in Canada. So you think, well, that sounds pretty pretty cool, we probably got that nailed down. Oh, no, 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 no. As always, there are folks who don't think this is a good idea. So I could point you to a website called Canada Family Action. And they refer to Bill C-279 as the gender or bathroom bill. And directly on their website, they, first of all, they call the conservative members who voted for it, conservatives in name only. 
taking a fantastic playbook from the Republican Party in the United States. And then they use terms like protect women and children, defend our country's morals, prevent gender confusion. So what they're distilling now is the rights and human dignity of transgender people into the bathroom. So let me talk about the bathroom. This is an interesting TED talk. So far I've talked about deception and I've talked about bathrooms. Uh, it'll improve, hopefully. So let's talk about the bathroom. So what they're essentially saying is that an entire group of people, transgender people, are essentially predators whose only goal is to get into a women's bathroom. They're not talking about trans guys. Apparently guys' bathrooms are very safe places where nothing bad ever happens. But just into women's bathrooms where they can prey on women and children. And why do they use this narrative? Because fear. Right? Fear is this base paleocortical human emotion that appeals to human emotion. And so, of course, we should never let facts get in the way of fear, because if we actually let facts get in the way of fear, we might think differently. So what does this mean? So, of course, what this means is that people should be afraid to use a bathroom if transgender people are there. But again, really, it's only visible transgender people, right? Nobody, you don't know who is necessarily transgender. I use the women's bathroom all the time, quite safely. And no, nobody, if I'm with my children by myself, people usually just ask me to pass them toilet paper or soap. It's not that big a deal. So I'm wondering maybe if what the Canada Family Action Council would suggest is that we should have genital, genital monitors at every bathroom. So when you go to use the bathroom, somebody checks to make sure you have the right genitals, and therefore you can use that bathroom safely. And also, you know, let's talk about hypocrisy. When we look at the bathroom, think about this. Who is the most likely person to commit a crime in a bathroom? Well, we know, for example, that white, heterosexual, cisgendered males are people who tend, up, tend to be in prison mostly for viewing child pornography, it's true, who end up mostly in jail for sexual assault. So if you really wanted to make bathrooms safe for women and children, you would actually ban all men from using public bathrooms. Let's take it even further. Let's look at clergy, right? Some of the most respected members of our community. Well, we know for a fact that members of clergy have been convicted, convicted in court of law of assaulting children. So let's take it there and let's, now, if you really want to care about the safety of women and children, then maybe what we should do is ban all clergy members from using public bathrooms. Now, of course, this is absurd. No person in their right mind would support this because what you don't do is you don't punish an entire group of, pe of people. What you do is if behavior is bad, you punish bad behavior. And that's individuals, not groups of people. So back to deception. So here we have again this notion that somehow transgender people are trying to pull a fast one over on the normal people. And in fact, transgender people aren't in any way trying to pull a fast one over on normal people. In fact, I would argue that transgender people are the most authentic people you can meet. These are people, despite the fact that they face increased levels of homelessness, poverty, violence, addiction, and mental health issues, despite all these facts, go out there every day and put their face to the world. I can tell you in my clinic, I have over 400 trans clients that I take care of. The stories I hear are horrifying. Where people go out in the street, they're yelled at, they're spit on, they're threatened. When a transgender person uses a bathroom and they don't, they don't look the part, there's a good chance that they're going to be threatened with violence. There's a good chance they're gonna have an act of violence committed against them. So really, again, it comes down to me, to this narrative of deception, that somehow that we're, we, myself being a transgendered woman, that we are trying to deceive you. And my argument is we're not trying to deceive anybody. In fact, we are living as authentically as any person has ever lived. And in a sense, we are putting our vulnerabilities out there for everyone to see. And again, I'd like to make a really salient point here, and I think it's a really important point. Ontario passed our legislation in 2012. And in two, since 2012, there has not been a single case of a transgender person assaulting a person in a, in, in a bathroom. Not a single case. Yet the converse is true. There are many transgender clients who are assaulted in bathrooms. And you know what happens when they go to, the, to tell the police? Especially if they don't look the part, the police say, well, you should use the right bathroom. That's the most common response they get. 
So really, when you ask yourself the question, who really needs protection? It's not the cisgender people. That's people who aren't transgendered, by the way. It's always good to have a name for the other people. It's transgender people. And that's who really needs protection. Hence, what I think is the reason that these rights are important and that we need to advocate for them. So again, <clears throat> I think, from my perspective, that we need to change the narrative, we need to look at transgender people differently, and we need to think differently. I want to reassure you that being transgender is not a guessing game. I always hate to use 20th century references with the YouTube generation because I often do this with my interns in the, in the emergency department. I'll ask them 1970s and 80s television trivia and most of the time they just look at me blankly. <laughs> but we're not your crying game. That's a 20th century movie reference for those who don't know. <laughs> it's a great movie, I highly recommend it, but I'm just saying it's a 20th century reference. But we are not somebody's guessing game. We are not somebody's, you know, genitals. We are, in fact, our own people. We are somebody's aunt, we're somebody's uncle, we're somebody's brother, we're somebody's sister, we're somebody's child. We're your doctor, we're your lawyer, we're your business person, we're your social worker, we're your friend. We live authentic and meaningful lives. Sorry, it's a bit awkward. So what I want you to think about today is be mindful of the new words for intolerance. So this is sort of safety dressed up as bigotry. So we talk about when you hear words, they're the new code words, right? Traditional family, traditional marriage, religious freedom. And that I think is really sad to take religious freedom and turn it into a code word for bigotry. And I think it behooves all of us to call these out. And what was refreshing for me is that even in a conservative state like Arizona, people from all sides of the political spectrum, regardless of their affiliation, recognized bigotry for what it was, bigotry. And despite maybe you might say Governor Brewer vetoed it for the wrong reason because she was concerned about business, regardless, that bill was vetoed. So to me, that's incredibly encouraging. And I do believe things are changing. So I'd just like to leave you with a couple of thoughts. One is, believe it or not, when transgender people use a the bathroom, they're using it to use the bathroom. There is no ulterior motive. There's no other reason they're using the bathroom. Much like yourself, they have needs. Those needs are often met by using a bathroom. <laughs> so what I would ask you is maybe, just maybe, you should think about that next time you see a transgender person in the bathroom. I want to leave you with a different word rather than deception. Maybe a word that has a better connotation for all of us. And that word is equality. And equality from the Oxford English Dictionary is a state of being equal, especially in status, rights, or opportunities. And I hope that one day we come to a world where when a transgender person uses a bathroom, they get to use it just because it's a bathroom. Thank you.